Welcome back and thank you for still staying there with us on Cosmopolitan Market. If you're just joining in, this is Cosmopolitan Market on Nigeria Customs Broadcasting Network, Channel 193 on Star Times. Always a pleasure to have you tune in. This is the conversation segment of the program and I have my guest with me live in the studio. He is Professor Ken Ife. He is Chief St Economic Strategist at ECOWAS and also a renowned macroeconomic analyst. Thank Welcome you. to the program, Prof. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Now, Prof, I know you have seen the GDP numbers. We mm. spoke about it yesterday when we were having a conversation. 0.51%. Did that come as a surprise to you? No. I actually expected a higher order, around 1%. But, but that's still very good. From 0 0.11 to 0 0.51 is quite a jump. But I had expected a 1%. But still, we'll still get there. Maybe in the next next quarter. Prof, you're quite optimistic because I, rem I, I was reading some reports before, mm. some I think sometime last week, and there were a lot of predictions of contraction in the first quarter of the year 2021. Why do you think there was the, the prediction came, the prediction seeming that the economy was going to contract rather than grow? No, no. I've always, since last October, predicted that we will get out of it in December. And, uh, and there were so many signs there because we were in, in the harvest season, and there are so many signs, signals that it was going to happen. And even now, the, it could have been more, if not for the fact that we are now in planting season. Yes. Uh, and this is when the food is more costliest because of, of, of planting activity by farmers and all that. But that goes more to inflation than, than, to, than to agricultural growth rate. Yes. But if you look at the figures, you can see that there is movement on literally half of the sectors, especially the oil came back, came back strong, even though it's still in negative territory, but it was quite a big jump from where it was in the fourth quarter. So the, the signs are there, and for the first time, transportation, which has been yes. aviation that was minus 57 this time last year, is now just about to break it, just about yes, to come to zero. So it's, it's a big, so it shows you a lot of recovery from the aviation sector, despite the COVID thing. More people are buying more planes. There are lots of stuff going on. And many other sectors are also showing positive signs, like the hospitality and accommodation. Yes, that, that I saw that food, also. And they're, they're also growing and they're very close to and the industry that was very very poor minus seven minus eight they are now yes. very close to to breaking even very close to zero so that's uh, that's also good news um ict surprised me a little bit to have dropped to just under eight percent you know from 15 percent in the last quarter. but but it's uh, it's nothing to worry about you see the highest growth that you can yeah. see in the sector and quite remarkably the oil bounce back also in contribution to the GDP, um, which was under 5% in, in uh, the but now about 9.2%. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a significant drop. And of course, the production volumes have also increased, you know, relative to what it was, was before. But still not, the, not, not, not near the target. So prices have also come up really strongly, the, the crude prices. Yes. So the combination of both means that we will see because i was just going to ask you that prof that do you do you think this growth we have seen 0.51 percent is as a result of the the fact the fact that we are seeing some stability returning back to the oil the international oil market it, it has it has a lot to do with it because don't forget that the the main growth was driven by non-oil sector and even then they still posted a positive growth but the oil came back still in negative territory but very very close to but and the quantitatively it made a lot more sense in terms of production volume and rising price. So the quant those two will give you a higher GDP contribution, which we saw uh, jumping from less than 6% to 9.2%. So it's quite a jump. Then agriculture and industry also. Um, agriculture slowed down a bit, yes. but still better yes. than, 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 than before because for the first time in many years, in the, in the, first, in the last quarter, it went to 3.6, right about. For the first time, exceeding population growth rate. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it just dropped to 2.2, I think, something like that, about 2.2. It's still, it's still okay, but it's below the population growth rate. Um, that this is not where you get the highest growth for agriculture. It's to towards the end of the year yeah. when you have the harvest season. True. Uh, this is usually the worst time, but still... 
still positive. Mm. Prof, I want to, I still stay with the subsector of the subsector aspect of the report, especially with our Greek sector now. We know it is no longer news that insecurity is really affecting the sector and we are seeing some we are seeing slow activity. Slow the, the the growth we are seeing that is slowed growth in the agricultural sector. Now I want you to how would you appraise the policies now? We know insecurity is a challenge on one hand, but the policies targets towards growth in the agri sector. How do you, how would you appraise the Im impact vis a vis this report that we have seen now? No look let me tell you something. This is a nation at war in six geopolitical zones, and it's an asymmetric warfare. That's one. But and many it's many I know, might not want to argue well, with you. It's decimated, it's decimated, decimated many sectors, particularly agriculture, because not only are there a huge displacement of farmers to IDP camps, but you have a shrinking agroecology. And at the same time, Nigeria is 200 million, but we are feeding 300 million people, mm -hmm. including the surrounding Francophone countries, Niger, Mali, uh, uh, the other one, Chad. We are feeding these people. That's why you have massive fleet of our food going up, up north there. So it's, it's, it's very big challenge. And the, one of the drivers of this, that movement of food out of the country, is because of the foreign exchange differential. Now, we used to buy three francs a far with one naira, but now you can only buy 1.2 francs a far with one naira. So you can see, Not to them, it's devalued about 60 to 70 percent. Yes. About 70 percent. So they fully, anything they sold here is cheap. And that's what they, they import. They don't import other things, though there are some, some areas you have some finished products going out too as well. But... But that's, that's the market surrounding us. But the food is so important to us. But there's nothing you can do about that. Because the COAS Treaty allows free movement of food. And, and you can't tax those because they're protected by the treaty. So that's that. But there are other areas that are heavily affected by the conflict. The conflict is the key driver mm. of the, the negative growth that we are seeing across many sectors. Um, but on terms of agricultural policy, I think... Um, for decades, the challenge with our agriculture are many. But the key factor that I see is that while FAO recognizes Nigeria as one of five countries in the world that produces more food than they require, the historic challenge has been that 30 to 70 percent of what we produce never make it into the food chain because mm -hmm. of post harvest losses, inadequate transportation, infrastructure, storage infrastructure, lack of enough power to dry it. So all of those, but now they are now compounded by security. Mm -hmm. And the dimension of that security is, Africa Union in 2012 says that uh, women account for 80% of the production of staple food. And they account for 80% of the processing of those staple food and 80% of the retail of these in rural and urban markets. And when these people are now endangered and they can't go to farm, they can't go and plant, they can't go and harvest, you know, it's tough luck. And then you have a shrinking agroecological footprint. So it's tough. So you have to meet that with mechanization, intense mechanization, clearing more lands in safer areas, and then bringing in better variety of crops that will increase you. So there's a lot more. And CBN has been on that case. It has been on that case because what we had was archaic agricultural production systems with subsistent farmers. But now, those subsistent farmers have now become commercial farmers, over 5 million of them now. Um, with access to finance just using their BVN and they are now integrated into an organized um, national and global supply chain. So you have an anchor that is making sure that those army of uh, farmers are getting the right seed, getting the right fertilizer mixed to the specification of their soil, herbicides, insecticides and mechanization services and then off taking all the produce from them. They don't have to carry produce all over. The, they will come to them and take the produce. So it's all in the funding frame. And they don't have collateral to bring. So they are being done without collateral. So it's a heavy transformation that we haven't seen. It's a revolution in the, in the agricultural sector. And we have to be grateful to the administration and, of course, the Central Bank for doing this. And they were, we wanted to do more. Because they're doing this in 10 agricultural value chain, presidential value chain. We wanted to do more. But even like oil, 
as, as you saw in the program, is so critical. If you plant one tree of oil or rubber, the oil is there for 150 years. So it's, it's there for much, much longer than the person who planted it. So we have to spend more, pour more resources in there. Uh, not only because of the economics of it, because it's, it costs about four times more. Um, you know, the, the price, the yeah. prices are about four well, times more than, than crude oil. And, uh, and you can never have enough of it. Sure. Uh, uh, crude oil, as you know, is, is, is on its way out. But not, not for that. But that is crude oil really on its way out? Well, when I say relatively, relatively, but it might come faster than we think. Mm. Anyway. Uh, when we say way out, it means it may cease to be the major contributor to our foreign exchange. Yes. Uh, many countries may not be interested in importing them because they already substituted uh, quite heavily. And so we will continue to use it in this country for 30 years. And maybe some of the plastic products produced from there can still be exported. But anyway, but it's not going to be business as usual. Mm. I like, I like the fact that you brought in this dimension of the discussion because just like you saw in the report before you came in, the president of Obgan, Joe Nuhe, he was actually even telling me that other countries, countries like Japan, now use the palm kernel shell to, yeah. produce, to produce electricity, to generate Correct. power. Correct. So that goes along with to further buttress your point that there's the, the crude oil, I, I was reading a paper that said we might eventually drink our oil if we don't do the right thing <laughs> at the right time, like you have said, the black gold might just might not be as sustainable as we thought it would be. Now, one cherry part of the report, Prof, that I want you to also speak towards is the manufacturing sector. Now, mm. we saw that the manufacturing sector exited negative zone and entered into positive growth path. What, what, what do you think? What would you say influenced this move? It could have actually done much better if it has enough foreign exchange. Because about 80% of our manufacturing capacity depend on some form of imported raw materials yes. or even spare parts or, and, and the equipment. So, and we have serious crunch. You know, we have forest crunch. So they're not getting as much as they will need, even though what we have is significantly being given to them, yes. uh, over 40%. But when you look at the refined crude being paid for by our foreign exchange is 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 criminal <laughs> but 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 it's happening yeah. you know and then you have all the subsidy stories going on so now so some of them have to now import by going to the uh, to the black market to buy their currency and that that increases cost significantly and then you have inflation pass through and that affects their their, their competitiveness because they are producing at a very high input cost mm -hmm. And then how do you compete? You are competing against products that are, um, that are subsidized to enter our country and undermine the, the, your, your price. And, you know, and our tax system is not reflecting that because we are locked into ECOA CET. Yes. And, and you only have to use levy instruments yes. to augment if you want it to. So it's very, very tough. Of course, you have to contain with, contain with smuggling as well, even if you try to raise the absolute tax the still smuggle the mean so it's not it's not the best of time for our manufacturers and then also there's also flow of capital uh, initially the dynamics in the capital market was such that with the low yield on securities yes. including uh, 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 all our in fact, the, the the money came down the interest rate came down so they said they're moving into the stock market yes. to pay, but now they are moving out because they are being conscious of the difficulties the manufacturing sector is facing, facing. and their, their challenges. And so, and that is hitting their balance sheet. So again, investors are, are, are moving, looking mm -hmm. for a safer heaven for their, for their investments, given the, the high interest rates, so the high inflation, inflation rate. rate. Mm -hmm. Prof, I want you to also speak to what are the fundamentals of growth that we need to put in place to ensure that we stay on this positive trajectory path no i think the 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 infrastructure is the core. first of all the security everybody knows without security nothing happens in fact the security has is knocking the confidence of investors completely foreign and domestic investors but besides security and the high unemployment of course the the area that government has actually been tackling is infrastructure that's what that's why we're borrowing so much money and you can see the money going into rail network, 
um, new standard gauge and the refurbishment of the new narrow gauges and then you saw the thousands of kilometers of these. Uh, do you know the last time there was investment in rail infrastructure was 1927? So, but this is happening now. And you have seaports, the maritime, uh, deep sea ports. You have uh, airports, the five international airports, having new terminals, yes. you know, over $800 million. And then you also have the, the highways and bridges. And you've seen those. So there's a lot of activity at the at the infrastructure side, of course, you've seen the power, even though they are augmenting the private, the power, there are investments going on with Siemens coming in and, and all that. So the government has continued to improve the infrastructure. It costs money. And then it's even more money than you would have projected. And don't forget that being in, in this kind of war uh, in those zones, Normally, many countries would just go and impose 30 to 40 percent of war tax and tell citizens to pay that. Prof, let me just or even go and borrow 100 billion dollars to, to fight the war. But we're not when doing you say that. war, Prof, explicitly tell me what do you mean? War means that there is uh, all kinds of conflicts in different zones. You know, I don't know how, how bad it could be mm. when thousands of people's lives are lost every year from deliberate attack, but it is asymmetrical. So it's very difficult for government to fight this war because of the nature of the war. You don't know who your enemy is. They're not dressed in uniform. There's no battle line. You just, they just spring up one midnight and then they massacre people and then you are chasing shadows. It's, 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 a, it's an asymmetric warfare going on. You know, you know where they are. Banditry in the northeast. They're even uh, two hours away from Abuja. So, so it's, a, yeah. it's not the most comfortable of thing, times. But, but then, also, the government has resisted imposing unnecessary tax just to augment the revenue to be able to deal with the other side of the story which says that yes you are borrowing within limits uh, within 21 percent which is between you know the limits benchmark benchmark is 40 to 6 percent yes. of the gdp but we're 21 percent so we're okay on the headroom but this the other side that is the repayment for yeah. the loan which says the debt service ought to be around 40 percent but yeah. we are over 40 56 you know going up and down and then all the government could have done is I said, look, if, if, our, if our government tax revenue is only 6% of GDP, why don't you triple it to come to the level of 18%, the average in the, in the continent? If you do that, you are going to punish more the people that are paying tax. Mm -hmm. So you're widening the tax base. And don't forget that just less than two years ago, we removed the tax for MSMEs yes, less than 25 million. Yes. So it's so difficult to be doing all that and still find the money to do all the things that tickle our fancy. And when COVID hit last year, it, it shocked everybody. It, it disrupted the supply chain. The many people, we predicted 60% drop in the, in the revenue. And then there was a huge drop in the revenue. And the budget was, was cut down. But eventually, we spent more than the budgeted in 2020. So, you know, it's difficult to just condemn the government for not doing better than they, they are doing. But there are areas where they are successful, mm. which is on the infrastructure, and they've created a company, infrastructure company, infrastructure. that is going to take, 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 take charge going forward with one trillion capitalization, and it's going to be heading out to the market for 15 trillion. In the agricultural sector, we've done well because you've seen major transformation in the sector. We could do better by getting more private sector big boys okay. in. And they are getting in. Dangote is on the 50,000 hectares of sugarcane. Bua group, 20,000. You have uh, Ola, 50. So those big boys are coming in. The more the merrier. Because that means that you are, you are sorting out the longer term future of commercial agriculture. Prof, I, are you rattled that for some time now we have seen a GDP growth rate that is lower than population growth rate? GDP growth has been, always been lower than population growth rate, mm -hmm. has it not? That. Population growth is 3.2%. Yes. Our GDP has been over the last five, six years, it's still been below, below, that. Below, below that. But um, uh, it's not the only answer because GDP is a number. True. <laughs> People will tell you that growth is also a number. Mm -hmm. you, you can have paper growth and you say have poverty you know, all over yes. the place. Yes. But I think in that respect, even the extreme poverty, which we believe is about 80, over 80 million people, it could have been worse. If you didn't have this 500 billion social intervention fund going in for six years per year, you could imagine what the figure would have hit over 100 million people below poverty line. So it's not easy. 
you know, people who are managing the economy are, are under stress and they are not um, you know, overly um, over dramatizing their success, but they are being much more, much more modest about it. There are things being done. Okay, what's the government doing about the debt situation? Government, apart from the infra com infra company, uh, uh, infrastructure company, government is exploring other avenues of funding the infrastructure and all that. That's why it's gone to pension fund. That's why it's created by Finance Act 2020, the the, the unpaid dividend fund yes. and, and the, these uh, dormant accounts yes. so that they can borrow against that. And they're even safer there, you know, than where they were before. And then they're also looking at creating national savings fund that will bring more resources in and then also reworking and rejigging and sweating government assets. You know, putting more pressure on BPE to privatize a lot of those and ICRC and their work. And then also looking to do other things that like bringing the assets into the equation. Because at the moment, the narrative is that give me money, lend me money on my cash flow. Mm. And when they look for the cash flow, they say, but there isn't cash flow because all the cash is going into repaying debt. But nobody's looking at the asset. So everybody knows what you owe, but nobody knows what you own. So but when you start looking at assets and bringing them into the frame, then you see that you can get more money without overheating the uh, creating fiscal stress. Now I can give an example. Saudi Aramco, uh, Saudi government wanted $25 billion. They didn't go to World Bank and IMF. They said, okay, Saudi Aramco is my company. How much is it worth? They valued it about $1.5 trillion. They all give me 25%. Well, 5%. 5% was $25 billion. That's yes. fine. That's it. And then had the money that he had, we haven't been doing this on our assets. We need to do that. Mm. So that the assets, we are sweating our assets, we are moving the management of these assets to higher level and all that stuff, and then begin to borrow against some of these assets. Prof, the MPC for the third MPC meeting for the year has kick-started today. Today mm. it's going to hold today and tomorrow, and we expect the governor of the Central Bank, Gordon Mifile, to reel out the decisions from the MPC to us tomorrow, I think at about 2 p.m. Now, what are your expectations? We have inflation at 18.12%, GDP 0.51%, and other metrics and parameters that the Monetary Policy Committee normally takes into cognizance before it comes to its decisions. What are your expectations from the meeting? Okay, there are three key parameters that they think are on. There may be other decisions. Um, one is the cash reserve ratio yes. of the banks, which at the moment is at 27.5. I don't think that we should increase that because we still have loan to deposit ratio raised to 60%. Possibly it could go to 65, but when you add that to the cash reserve, they are substantially squeezed in terms of cash. Yes. And you've taken away those luxury money that they were using. The, the, the automata account yes. and all those hundreds of billions, they, they've gone away. So I think we should leave that. Then you look at liquidity ratio at 30%. I think we should still leave that because we are in time of crisis. And you remember last year, CBN granted statutory forbearance to the banks to restructure loans and all of that. And even then, the banks have all been working hard and then the loan to deposit ratio is improving. More liquidity is coming to the private sector lending and then you also have um, non-performing loans coming down, heading to the 5% prudential guideline. Then even capital adequacy ratio is also improving for many of them, heading to 15% on this one above. Now, so that leaves us with the monetary policy, policy rate. rate yes, yeah. Now, the monetary policy rate, I wouldn't want to change that where inflation is slowing. You don't know which way it is going to go. You want to see, give it, give it another like, quarter to see where it's heading. Then, second one of you've got the growth in GDP, marginal growth. You don't want to take any action that could send you back again yes. into recession. So we just have to watch that. So if I was the P MPC, I would say wait, wait and see. Just give it another one to see which which way these things are going to play. The main thing is this: the base that uh, ratio. Not ratio. That rate is always used to tame uh, uh, cash, uh, you know, the availability yes, liquidity. Yes, flow it's always credit. used to tame liquidity. But the thing is this: the inflation is not actually caused by in, in in a large measure by money supply, because there are two sides of money supply. 
the amount of supply in the domestic economy. There's foreign exchange money supply, mm -hmm. which is where we're having problem. Your policy here will not affect that. What affects that is the price of oil yes. and the volume allowed to us to... We don't control the volume, we don't control the, the price. price. So, and then at the moment, we're not getting as much.